Are you expectant? Good. So let's stand to our feet and get ready to worship the Lord. So Father, we just, we just thank you for your abiding presence. We thank you that you're here. We don't need to conjure it up. We don't want to fake it till we make it. We know that you are here in our hearts. And you are here as your people gather. You are here in this room. And you are more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask and think. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and do the work that only you can do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain, praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting, praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded, praise when I'm my enemies drowning. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I won't be quiet, my God is alive. How can I keep it inside? Praise Oh my soul, oh my soul I praise when I feel it I praise when I don't I praise cause I know If you're still in control Praise is a weapon It's more than a sign Praise is the shots that we're getting to go down. As long as I'm breathing, I got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I won't be quiet, my God is alive. How can I keep it inside? Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I praise cause you're sovereign. I praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and you feed in the grave. I praise cause you're faithful. I praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Praise cause you're sovereign. I praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and you feed in the grave. Praise cause you're faithful. I praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul, I won't be quiet, my God is alive, how can I keep it inside? Praise the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. I got a little secret to tell you. Ella and her sisters are going to be playing at the Royal Albert Hall. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. 
You take Sean down in my ear a little bit. I get oh, it. Why? I get it all week. And it's really, isn't it? I raise a hallelujah. Yeah, Lord, Press up my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, King is alive. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. Then watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on me. I'm gonna say in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, King is alive. Sing a little louder. 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 I'm gonna say in the middle of the storm, louder and louder. Gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive. I'm going to sing, and I'm going to sing, middle of the storm, louder and louder, going to hear my praises roar, up from the ashes, hope will arise, death is defeated, the king is alive, yes, he's 
He's alive, he's alive. A thousand generations falling down in worship. Sing a song of ages to the land. And all who've gone before us, all who will believe, will sing a song of ages to the land. Your name is the highest, your name. It's the greatest, your name stands above them all. From all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, oh, name. O creation Christ, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. If you've been forgiven. If you've been redeemed, we'll sing the song forever to the land. And if you walk in freedom, if you bear to sleep, we'll sing the song forever to the land. We'll sing the song forever and day. Angels cry, holy, O creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. Hear your people say, Holy to the King of Kings. Holy, you will always be. Holy, 
So we're asking for the Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the water. And you've heard me say this before. It's the raw calf Spirit of God. It's not just to rest on you and do nothing. It is a violent shaking that the Spirit of God did over the face of the water. And so when we're singing that song, we are saying, God, would you come by your Spirit and violently shake? over us and in us would you shake out our complacency would you shake out us out of our levels of apathy God would you shake us to the core so that we would not stay the same would you stir us and would you break within us that which causes us to stay the same So God, I don't want you just to rest on me and do nothing. I need you to come rest on, in, around and violently shake my insides so that I will not stay the same. And for some of us, that's issues of fear and anxiety. So where you have fear and anxiety within you right now let's just touch your belly 
And let's ask that raw calf spirit of God to violently shake upon it that it will not stand and stay, but it would come up and out. By the power of the cross and by the power of, of his blood. And there's some people that are um, dealing with disappointments. God, would you come and violently shake me at my level of disappointments, meet me where I am, but cause them to shake and shift up and out of me. And God, would you come and give me fresh vision? There's an exchange that occurs when we ask the raw calf spirit of God to come and violently shake over us. Thank you, Jesus. Rise up on sleeper. Rise up on sleeper. Awake from the dead. Awake from the dead. Awake. 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 Shake it up, Lord, when you went there. Well, I've met Paul before. Um, it was quite a different experience to now. Uh, <laughs> but we'll just leave some mystery around that. But it's been a privilege to uh, get to know Pastor Winnell while she's been with us this weekend. And uh, Dave and Trace have been hosting them. 
and uh, we're so excited uh, about what she's got to bring this morning. And uh, I've said to her to do what she likes. I've given her till, well, the usual time. We'll just say that. So a good, a good 50 minutes. But that could include ministry and everything. All right? So it's going to be great. So, Lord, we just pray for Pastor Winnell. We pray, Father, your spirit would just rest upon her as she brings your word. I pray, Father, she won't hold back. I don't think she will anyway, but we'll pray it anyway. Lord, don't let her hold back. Don't let her hold anything in her heart, but let it just flow out with freedom in this place, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you guys for having us. It's been a a real joy being here. And uh, I've been here about five years ago. We were at um, Pastor Tony Williams' church with them, with my my parents. And uh, it's just great to be back. And um, I just... Uh, want to say I just really feel like that I was up and down last night really just praying and asking God what he uh, wanted to say to us today and I know Thursday for those of you that were here I spoke quite a bit about discipleship and about sharing the salt of meaning bringing people to the table and how that you would minister to them but this um, this morning I woke up with this scripture and I'd like to invite you to read um, with me in 1 Peter 2.12. And um, I know I've read this scripture before, but I think it's so... Uh, you know, uh, this is the thing about God's Word. I know a lot of times we, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this last night, where, where that we're always trying to find, you know, the next big thing or the next special thing or the next idea or the next uh, program or something that we want to implement. And every time I come back to the Word and I reread Word and then I read scriptures that I read before and then I look at the scripture and I think, how did I miss that before? And, you know, it's just incredible. And I'm sure those of you who you know, preach, you uh, understand that, those of you who are in the Word. But in 1 Peter, I'm going to read out of the Life Study Bible, but it says in verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the unsaved Gentiles. I think some of the translations actually use heathen, and I think some of them actually use pagan. Uh, excellent among the unsaved Gentiles, conduct, conduct yourself honorably with graciousness and integrity so that for whatever reason they may slander you as evildoers, yet by observing your good deeds, they may instead come to glorify God in the day of visitation, when he looks upon them with mercy. I don't know about you, but when I read this scripture, and I think about the fact when he says, first of all, keep your behavior excellent. Um, excellence a big word. Excellence is something that, you know, I love to strive for when, whenever we're doing whatever we're doing. And when it says to do that among the unsaved... If you skip on down and then he says, when he talks about considering to conduct yourselves honorably with integrity, so that even if they slander us by observing our good deeds, they come to know Jesus Christ. You know, um, there's a lot of stories and I think that sharing testimonies is always good, especially when You know, we travel and minister. I think it's good for you to hear testimonies from other places, not only to build your faith, but to see how that sometimes, and especially, you know, in our third world countries, we can see how that people uh, very differently react to evangelism or react to, you know, missionaries or people when they go in. And when we went to Tanzania, uh, we were staying in a place that actually Reinhard Bunke, I'm, I'm made to understand, uh, 50 years ago, stayed there with his team. And uh, it doesn't look like that anymore, by the way, whatever it looked like before. <laughs> but uh, when we stayed there, 
there was a young lady that was taking care of us in the restaurant part. And, you know, there were uh, a lot of time while we were there in the day, she would be preoccupied doing other things and you would ask her to get you coffee in the morning. I know one morning it took us an hour and 15 minutes to get a cup of coffee. And you know, it's to the point that you want to just feel like, how long does it take, you know, to make a cup of coffee? And, um, as we began to keep interacting with her, you know, we just kept treating her, you know, with honor and respect. And we told her, you know, we understand if you're busy or doing other things. I mean, it did look like that they weren't too organized, but it, nevertheless, we kept our integrity. And the reason I share this with you is because that without even trying, we weren't really witnessing to her in that respect. We weren't sitting down with her sharing who Jesus was. But the other thing that we did do is the, the people who had invited us there, their church had a lady who was a chef and she was cooking meals for us and bringing them to the place where we were staying every day for us to eat. And so what would happen is at the end of the time that we would eat together with the, the pastor who was also there with us and our team, we then would give the rest of the food to her and her kitchen staff for them to share and eat. Now, I know that sometimes we don't think about the small things, but we still gave them the food in the same receptacles that they were given to us. They were very nice. They had lids on them. So when she took them to eat from them, we didn't expect her to do anything different. We didn't, you know, we didn't dish them all out on some paper plate and just, you know, hand them over to her. We just expected her to eat the same as us. And sometimes when you think about the small things, you don't think about the fact that you're making such an impression, a godly impression upon people. And it wasn't until we left and came home that the man who was working there with us, um, our contact, he wrote me and he said, you're never going to believe what happened after you guys left. He stayed an extra day. And he said when he went into the dining room and he sat down, she came over to him and said, oh, have the missionaries and their team gone home now? And he said, yes, they had to go back. They're back in England now and on to the next thing that God has for them. And she said, you know, I've never encountered the kind of Christian behavior that I saw this week. I know I let them down because um, she actually highlighted this herself, even though we hadn't said anything to her. She said, you know, one day it took me an hour and a half to get them a cup of coffee because I, I got distracted and it was my fault. But she said, you know, every night and every time they ate, you guys gave me the food to share with my staff and you, you allowed us to eat from the same uh, receptacles that they ate and with the same dishes. And I began to watch them and the way that they acted. And it was so constant and consistent. And she said, so I'm here to ask you, what kind of God is it that you serve, actually? He got a chance to witness to her. And when he rang me, he said, I'm calling to tell you that today she gave her heart to the Lord. Now, listen, he did say to her, he said, listen, I want you to go away and think about this because, you know, I know some people get a bit hyped up and they're thinking about people being here and what's happened. And she said, listen, I don't need to think about this anymore. I already know that if there are people like that, that that's what causes them to behave like that. That's the kind of God that I want. The point I'm trying to make today is that sometimes we do not realize with our behavior, the way we treat people, the way we act. Uh, negatively or positively, the difference that we're making in their lives. And so when I read this scripture and I think about the fact that he says, keep your behavior excellent. There's something uh, that really was kind of bothering me last night about discipleship. And, you know, our ministry is called Commission. Um, you can find it later if you want to look it up, commission.one. But we're all about creating a discipleship culture. And a lot of times when people talk to us about discipleship, it's talking to us in the regard of it as if it's something that you do, you get to tick off the box and say, I did that and now I can move on. I wonder how many times that we stop to consider and think about something. You are never going to be able to stop being a disciple. I think that should sink in a bit. 
Every day we need to be disciples, but we also need to be making disciples. Um, there's something very interesting that I want to point out to you in some of my notes as I was looking at this scripture. When you look at the word good, it's found in the Greek to mean, and I'm, I never pronounce this right because obviously I don't speak Greek, but kalos, which can be translated as beautifully or lovely. The idea is that we're supposed to be living a radiant and compelling life. Now, when I think about this, you know, when we talk about leadership and we talk about discipleship, really it all boils down to a, an invitation and a challenge. And it's knowing when to invite and when to challenge. The invitation I spoke a little bit about on Thursday, and I know as simple as it sounds, that when we talk about inviting people to a table or inviting people to a meal, you're inviting them in to build a relationship with them. You're inviting them in to actually create a space to where that you have a right to speak into their lives. One of these things that I learned even way back, um, I'm, a, I'm actually a, a certified teacher with the state of Texas, and I've done this, uh, I did it for years way back when I was in America for a while, and then I went to Latin America, and I actually helped them. Uh, once I got my master's, I took over with a, directing a bilingual school. And one of the things that they will tell you when you're in a classroom is that 50% of your teaching boils down to classroom management. And before I would go into the classroom to teach the, the students, and I taught high school, I taught in a Title I school in America, which is actually your low income to poverty students. And when I went in there, I could tell that it wasn't going to be easy. It was a mixture of cultures. And obviously, our high schools uh, look very different than your secondary schools here. Our, our high school was actually 2,500 students. And I was uh, in charge of not all at one time, but I had 120 students that I was uh, in, uh, in charge of and to look after. I was teaching them Spanish and English as a second language. But you know, one of the things that God spoke to me before I went into that classroom is, first, you must win their hearts. So what I would do is I would take about five to six weeks and I would do different activities. Um, it was a bit related to the language, but I would do activities to build relationships with them. And I'm not saying I became their best friend because that was not the goal. The goal was that I wanted to earn their respect and I wanted them to know that I was there for them. Remember, we're not allowed to talk about God in our schools, but I needed to find a way for them to know. You don't need to know that I'm a Christian to know that I care. You don't need to know that I'm a Christian to know that I, I'm, I'm here because I want to be. I'm not here because someone placed me here. I chose to be here. I chose to teach you. I chose to be a part of your life. And you know, after I did that for six weeks, once I got into the teaching, this, as God is my witness, you can go and ask any of my teacher friends. I never had problems with classroom management because I had earned a right to speak into their lives. I had earned a right for the opportunity to be able to speak into them and make a difference for them. A lot of times we don't like wasting the time of getting to know people. But the thing that we have to understand is when you skip the part of the invitation. You skip the part of being able to sit down and do the niceties of getting to know them and a bit of their story and where do they come from and what are they all about. For you to have the opportunity to know what you can do once you get to know them. It's a simple process. And then you have to know when is the opportunity that I'm going to get to challenge them. It may not come immediately. It might come afterwards. But this is the first thing that I want to tell you. When you really study the scripture, God never told us. Jesus didn't leave the earth and say, you need to go and get everybody saved. Prove me wrong. It's not in the word. He said... Before he left the disciples, go and make what? Disciples. You see, a lot of people say to me, yes, but to make disciples, you know, we have to do this, we have to do that. 
Listen, discipleship, and I know this was mentioned last night, but we were a firm believer in this in our, in our ministry. Discipleship starts before a person even gets saved. We have to be abundantly clear about that. And discipleship is about you building a relationship and witnessing to people to be able to invite and then challenge them to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. But first of all, we have to be disciples. Come on, I want you to say that with me. I need to be a disciple. To be a disciple, you have to agree that you're going to be a disciple the rest of your life. That's tough. You know, we are conditioned. We want to graduate. We want to finish. We want to come out of this. We want to get the certificate. We want to walk away and say, I've done this. Now what's next? If Jesus spent three years with 12 men, think about it, three years with 12 men, and they were constantly making mistakes, And he would correct them. And then he would send them back out. And then he would correct them. He would teach them. And he would send them back out. He knew the importance of pouring into their lives and building into them. Sometimes we want to skip that step. We don't see the necessity of doing certain things. You know, I see, uh, and, and all power to them, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but those who love preaching in the streets, it it sometimes just, makes me wonder, is it because it's easy? I know it's not easy because they get laughed at, they get ridiculed, but sometimes I think that we, we feel like we've ticked a box. We've gone and we've stood on the corner and we've preached out loud and we've shouted to the top of our lungs about that Jesus saves. And yes, I know that there are a few people that get saved and I'm not saying, and if that's what God's called you to do, please know I'm not telling you not to go and do that. But the thing that I'm trying to help us understand is that sometimes we have this thought pattern of what we think we ought to be doing. But if you read all about Jesus all the time, it was always one-on-one or one-on-groups and small house groups and people that he spoke to. And I believe it was an example to us that you must be willing to get out there, build the relationships, take the time, be willing to give the challenge. You know, I want to tell you why it's so important to be able to do this on a small scale. I want you to, I wrote down a few notes. You can give challenge from up here, but challenge is always given best with personal relationships. See, we have the ability to hear a sermon. Could be a sermon that's challenging. Could be a sermon that challenges us about You know, maybe they teach us on forgiveness or they talk to us about how that we need to change our behavior. But when you walk out of these doors, who actually will hold you accountable to make a change? You see, because it's so easy to hear it, walk out of here and think, well, you know, that was a great message. So glad our pastor preached that today. It really touched my heart. We take a few notes and then we don't do anything about it. But then when you are in a one-on-one, you know, even when you get in small groups, it's comfortable, it's inviting. But then there has to come a point to where that there is some kind of a challenge Every day we need to be challenged because if we are not challenged, basically what we are saying to one another is we've reached it. We're perfect. We don't need this anymore. We're done. We've done this. Man, I mean, I'm, I'm it. I've arrived. I don't need any more changing. I don't need any more teaching. I know what I'm doing. I know what it takes. Do you actually know what it takes? Because it means every day, you know, people who have issues with certain things, you know, some people battle anger more than other people. You talk to them, you'll know that it's not a one day thing. It's an everyday thing that when they get up, they have to choose and decide how they will handle themselves that day, how they will react to certain situations. You take people who are alcoholics, you know, think about it. 
I, I don't like alcohol. I've never really drank alcohol. In fact, there's a very funny story about that when I married Paul. Um, but when you think about someone who is an alcoholic, they can pass by bars and places where they, they know that they don't want to get a drink because of what it will do to them. But then I could walk in and sit down and you could put a whole wall of it in front of me and it wouldn't make any difference. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have to know what our limits are. We have to know what our limitations are. We have to know what are our boundaries. Where is it that how far can I go? How, how do I put myself in certain situations? So when we know what we need, the scripture is very plain even in, when you get down to Philippians and it tells you about the things that you should think about, the things that you should be doing for your life. Folks, this is something you have to do every single day. It's not just a something that you do today and then you don't do it tomorrow. It's something that every day you have to work on and you have to believe that God is going to do something in your life. And you know, I'll tell you this, your hunger will determine your response. Your hunger will determine your response. I'll tell you about a young man we met in Uganda. His name is, we call him John the Great Mechanic. When I was preaching, we, well, we teach a Bible school there. Um, we have uh, 75 students that we teach every week. We're graduating them in November. Some of them walk three hours every week to come to the class. That's the commitment that you see at that level. When we were speaking in their church, it was our first Sunday in Uganda. It was in September. And while I was preaching, God spoke to me about a young man that was in the, off, in the audience. And I saw him, but I really didn't know what I was supposed to say to him. So I didn't want to say anything. So I kept preaching and God kept saying to me, I want to do something with that young man. And I'm, you know, I'm like preaching and I'm having this silent going back and forth with God, like, I, I get it, but I don't know what I'm supposed to say. When I tell him to stand up, what am I going to say to him? And um, finally, I just felt compelled to stop. And I just said, young man, will you stand up? And uh, when he stood up, the Lord just said to me, ask him what his story is. So I'm, <laughs> you can ask Paul. We were sat in front of, uh, I think it was about 300 people. So I said, young man, what, what's your story? What do you do? And he said, well, he said, uh, I'm 22 and I want to be a mechanic. And I said, so what are you doing to be a mechanic? And he said, well, he said, uh, because my parents don't have the money to send me to school, um, I found a mechanic place where I can go and serve and learn on my own. And he said, so I go every day. And sometimes I have a bike that I take because it's 15 miles away, but sometimes I have to catch rides. Sometimes I have to walk part of the way. But I try to never miss because I'm so determined to learn. And I said, what is your name? And he said, my name is John. And I said, John, how long have you been doing this? He said, for three years. And he said, and I also am doing it for free because I don't get paid. And I looked at him and I thought, here is a young man. He wants to be a mechanic so bad that he's going to a mechanic shop and he's serving every day for free until God opens a door for him. And so God spoke to me and said, just tell him that today there will be a change in his house. So I told him that. At the end, when I sat down, obviously Paul and I were talking, our ministry often when we can, we try to, to give and help young men like that. And I just said to Paul, I said, I really don't want us to be the ones because I want God to use someone else, but I feel like we're to be the initial ones. So we discovered that it was going to be about 400 pounds to send him to school. And when he came down, I called him down to the front and I said to him, I said, John, I want you to look in the mirror every day and I want you to say, John, you are a great mechanic. And he was laughing and he said, yes, I, I will 100% do that. And then we told him that we had agreed that we were going to pay the first part of his school so that he could start to university and be able to become a mechanic. 
And he fell down on his knees at our feet and he was crying. And then I asked him to stand up and I said, John, tell me about your parents. And he said, my dad is a witch doctor. My dad also has two official wives and he has several concubines and my mother lives separately from them. And I sat there and I, I stood there, man, and I looked at this young man and I thought, I don't understand the disconnect sometimes between our worlds and the worlds of people where that they have hardly nothing, but they have such determination and such faith to step out and believe for the big things and to do what it takes for it to happen. And you know, I said to John, I said, John, I believe that God is going to bring salvation to your home and to your father. I believe that this will speak volumes through him. We have since heard that his dad has been asking a lot of questions. He doesn't understand what kind of God would compel people to give to his son to be able to become the great mechanic. Now listen, I want you to understand. The reason I tell you this story is because this is the thing. If a young man who is 22 has decided that he feels like what God has called him to do is to be a mechanic, and he goes every day and he's willing to serve until God opens a door and provides, which now he has after three years. Who are we that we serve the God Almighty, the God who can answer any prayer, the God who's there for us, the God who loves us, the God who rescued us from our sin, the God who, who always provides and is there for us. Who are we not to be with the same determination? Are you hearing me today? The same determination that every day we need to be be a disciple and we need to disciple and we need to work on our behavior. We need to work on our attitude. We need to compel ourselves that we need to change. Hallelujah. Look around you. You're not full. You can blame pastors and leaders all you want to, but you can't be pew warmers. You are the ones who are supposed to be making disciples. Maybe you want to skip the steps that you don't like. But when is going to come the day where we can freely say to God, Lord, I'm ready to get out of my comfort zone. I'm ready to stop just being mundane every day, doing the same old thing. Lord, today I have decided I want to be different. Stop asking God to change you. You need to change. You know, when I first came to England, so many people told me, we don't get that excited here because it's not our culture. That really burns me up, you know? And I'll tell you why. You can be English all you want to, but you now belong to a kingdom of God. You have kingdom culture, not English culture. You shouldn't be saying that's not my culture because that isn't your culture anymore. Your culture is kingdom culture. And kingdom culture means if you love God, you need to be excited about God. You need to worship God. You need to sing like you love him. You need to act like you love him. How? How can you not do that? How can you come every Sunday and think, oh, hopefully they sing the song I want them to sing or they sing the right song or the, the song the way I like it or hopefully they have this or hopefully I have that. How come we don't come in with a song already on our lips? Already ready to worship before you walk through the doors. That is not dependent on here. You know, I've been a worship leader in my dad's crusades. And one of the things that the first thing I used to tell all the time to new church evangelism, I am not your cheerleader. Yes, I will sing and worship and run the platform, but I don't do that for you. 
I do that because I love God and I worship Him. You can't depend on this platform to change you. You can't depend on this platform to challenge you. You need to challenge yourselves. You need to change the way you think. The scripture says, so as you think are you. You have to replace some things and do things differently. You know, when I was teaching, I teach uh, teachers in Columbia on Saturdays. They get up 6 a.m. every Saturday morning. And uh, Dave very kindly loaned me his war room to get in there and teach. And God gave me such an analogy uh, yesterday when I was teaching them. You know, lifestyles have to change when you choose and make the decisions that you make. And the analogy God gave me was, uh, how many of you here are married? All right. So how many of you are still single? Right. So I'm going to tell you that as a single, you know when they say enjoy your life and make sure you do certain things, not the wrong things, but certain things that you want to make sure you get. Because, you know, I talk to some of my married friends sometimes and they're like, wow. You know, I just didn't think life was going to change this much. You know, now that I'm married, it's just not the same. It's not going to be the same. You know, for example, now you can get up and maybe if you're old enough, you can just walk out of your house and, hey, mom or dad, I'll be back after a while. I'm going to go have a cup of coffee or I'm going to go this. And you may not see them until 10 o'clock that night. You can't do that when you're married. Or at least you shouldn't. Your, your partner, your husband, your wife, they should know where you're going and what you're doing. They need to be able to keep up with you. You know, we... We actually track each other's phone. That's just so I... You know, I don't do that to check up on Paul. I do that because I want to know he's safe. And my kids, I make them do the same. I'm like, you know what? Put that thing on. I'm going to know you're okay. And to be honest, I rarely go find it unless I suddenly think, you know, I haven't heard from my kids in a while. See where they are. But you know, life changes. You don't do things alone like you used to. You don't just make decisions by yourself. You have to sit down. You have to discuss things. When you spend money, you don't just get to run out and buy what you wanted to buy before. You don't even get to shop like you used to shop because now things have changed. When you become a believer, things change. You don't get to keep doing and keep acting like you did before and keep saying, I can't help it because this is not me. This is who I am. I can't help it. You can help it. You have to make up your mind and make the decision that you want to change. No one accidentally creates disciples. It's intentional. No one accidentally becomes a disciple. So we have to ask ourselves the question, how are we going to grow the church and make disciples? How are we going to do this? How do we reach people who don't know Jesus? How are we going to help our church grow? How do I reach the person that is my coworker or the person I study with or the person I hang out with that doesn't know Jesus? How do I reach them? How do I get to them? You know, a lot of times we're always thinking, I'll leave that to the next guy. I'll leave that for someone else to do. That's not really my thing. How can it not be your thing? There's nowhere in the scripture where it says, if it's your thing, go and make disciples. Does it? It doesn't really do that. He said, go and make them. He said, go and do something. And even in our way and our own imitable style, we are able to reach people and talk to them. We're able to make a difference in their life. 
But you know, most of us are so good at just attending church. Don't you get bored of just attending church? I don't understand that. I really don't. When I was 12, I was already knocking doors in Colombia because we uh, were missionaries and we had teams come down and I helped lead the teams and we would go door to door. And I remember that we came across a young man who came to the crusade that we were doing and he got saved. And then all of a sudden, for this was in Colombia, and all of a sudden after a few days, we didn't see him. So we began to pray for him because we knew that it being such a devout Catholic nation that sometimes the parents would kick off. And, you know, I'm talking about this was a young man who was 26 because most of the time in Latin America, you know, uh, kids live at home until they marry. And sometimes they don't marry until they're 29, 30. It's, it's kind of a culture thing. But he disappeared and we didn't know what had happened. And finally, after about a month, he showed up at our crusade. And I'll never forget, when he came walking through, I said, oh, his name was Ivan. I said, Ivan, I haven't seen you in so long. We were worried about you. He said, oh, he said, you know, I went home. My dad asked me, where had I been? And I said, oh, I've been to the crusade up the street. And he said, my dad said, if you go back again, I'm blocking you away in your room for a month for punishment. And that's what happened. And I said, I'm so sorry. He said, yeah, all he did was bring me food, brought me drinks, and he made me stay in my room for one month, locked the door. He said, but you know what? He said, don't feel sorry for me. Because he said, something really amazing happened. He said, have you ever read the book of Acts? I said, yes, I have. And he said, wow, I was locked away in my room and I thought, what am I going to do? And I got my Bible out and I said, well, you know, my dad can lock me away for a month, but he can't make me stop praying and reading the word. I found the book of Acts and I started reading it and I started reading about the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't even touch about the Holy Spirit because it's new church evangelism. So we talk a lot about salvation and we reiterate that and about helping them do life change. And obviously we do eventually get to the Holy Spirit, but he hadn't been coming long enough for that. And he said, when I found that, I realized that people were being filled with the baptism of the Spirit and speaking in other tongues. And I said, Lord... If it doesn't take anything special, fill me right here, right now. And he said, hey, I came to tell you, I don't even know what this is, but I've been speaking in this other tongue every night and I've been praying. And now God spoke to me and I know it was God and he's called me to preach. He is one of our pastors somewhere in Colombia now. You see, your hunger determines your response. Even when you're locked away for a month, you want God so bad. You want change so bad. You're willing to do what it takes. When we talk about being shaken, we need to shake ourselves. You know, the scripture even says, don't worry, I'm about to close. Encourage yourself. Did you know there's a scripture that says that? It says, encourage yourself. Talk to yourself. Tell yourself you need help. You need to get with it. You need to do something. We can't keep letting. I'm, I'm telling you, I know painting's not saved. It's not. And if, you, and if it is, Torquay's next door. Right? So there's still a lot of room for you to evangelize. There's still a lot of room for you to build relationships. There's still a lot of room for you to make a difference. And remember, when we understand the difference of what we need to do as individuals, we will begin to see the church change. I hope I can find this saying that I wrote down um, about when you change the way you think and then that changes the way you live. And then when you change the way you live, God helps you through you to change the world around you.
We need to do something. We need to step up to the plate. We need to be disciples. We need to create disciples. We need to make disciples and look after them. You know what making disciples means is that you take on the responsibility of looking after them, nurturing them, feeding them the word, making sure they're okay, praying for them. Not every time they need prayer, don't worry, let me just call the pastor and I'll get him to pray for you. Not every time they need someone to listen to them, oh, let me just see if the pastor's available. It's your disciple. You bring them up. You raise them up. Pull them in. Pull them along. Encourage them. Get out of your own comfort zone and out of your own head and make a difference. Don't just slide by when you get into heaven. I think that more than anything, I just want to encourage you that there's still a lot of work to do. And God needs you. And even though you may not be a pastor or evangelist or a missionary per se, you still can be evangelistic. You can be pastoral. You can be missional. Do you understand what I mean? You can be prophetic. You don't have to call yourself a prophet, but it doesn't mean you can't be used in the prophetic. You don't have to be called an apostle, but it doesn't mean you can't be used in the apostolic. You don't have to call yourself an evangelist, but it doesn't mean that you can't be evangelistic. You know, one of our friends that I work with in their ministry, he's making a massive difference just handing out little cards that says, somebody loves you. And on the other side, I think you can find them on Amazon, actually. And on the other side, it's just a simple little message about Jesus loving them. There's so many things that we can do. But we're always waiting for someone to push or Pull us here or pull us there or say the right thing. I would say more than anything today that I'd like to pray for you that God stir you up. Stir yourselves up and ask God to make a difference. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. I just want to pray with you. Lord, I thank you today. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord God, because you're so amazing. And Lord, we are here today because of you. Many of us who had no hope, here we stand with purpose. And Lord, I pray for each and every person here today, including myself. Lord, help us to stir ourselves up. Help us to step out of our comfort zones. Help us to recognize, oh God, that we are the ones that need to do something. Lord, there are people that are not only dying and going to hell, there are people that are waiting to hear a message of hope, a message of love. Lord, and we have many things that we need to grow in. But Lord, more than anything, we need to grow in being a disciple and making disciples. Being an example. Making connections with people. Knowing when to invite. Knowing when to challenge. Lord, I pray. Lord, as I make the invitation today to everyone. Lord, I pray. Invite them, Lord, to come into your presence with a different attitude of saying, Lord, what can I do different? What can I do different to make a difference in this world right where I am, Lord? And Lord, not only that, how can I begin to disciple them once I reach them, Lord God? How can I speak into their lives? Lord, give me the right words. Give me the right scripture. Help me, Lord God, to live more according to your word, Father. 
Help me to realize, Lord, that I'm never going to reach the end until the time comes to be with you. Every day there will still be challenges and things to go through. But Lord, I thank you that you're always right there. I thank you that you always answer, Father God. Lord, I ask that you speak. Lord, I pray that you stir them up, Father. Stir them up. Lord, may they recognize that there is more to it than this. Lord, that you need them. Lord, that you need us to be out there reaching your people, making a difference. Inviting people to our table, sharing the salt, sharing a meal, sharing a word, listening to stories. All of us, Lord God, can improve. All of us, Lord, can do better. And Lord, I pray that all of us will have that desire to want to do better. All of us will have that desire To want to do things differently. To want to win the lost truly to you, Father. And Lord, even with the most difficult ones. Help us to love them. Help us to not see the outward. But help us to see the inward that you see, Father. Help us to see them the way you see them Father Lord I pray that there will be such a difference here today Lord that things will begin to move things will begin to happen even leading up to heart of prayer Lord and people getting into the attitude of prayer and fasting and believing Lord God that as they reach down into the downtown Lord that there will be change that things will happen but Lord even now we can begin To change the atmosphere, Father. We are atmosphere changers, or at least we should be, Father. Help us. Help us to recognize that, Father. And Lord, above all, help us to recognize that we are now of your kingdom culture. Your culture is our culture now. And Lord, I just give you praise for that. And I thank you, Father. And I ask this in your name, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. I just want to do something quick before I finish. I have uh, something I brought from Tanzania that I wanted to um, give to Sean and, is it Tracy? Right. I wanted to bless both of you. Um, This is some material that I brought back from Tanzania. Feel free to make whatever you like. (laughs) And this is for you. (laughs) I just wanted to bless you and say thank you for opening up your home. And uh, whatever you feel led to make with it. And just know it's super fancy. Amen. God bless you. I've forgotten your name. It's back there. It, you're, you're Pastor's son, aren't you? Stand up for me just a minute, please, before I sit down. Uh, what is your name? Taylor? Caleb. Caleb, just quickly, what do you do? What are you going to be doing here? I don't normally dream, but last night I had a dream about you. (laughs) And um, (laughs) I just felt God saying to me that there's something uh, key with you about discipleship and about how God wants to use you. I don't even really know what that looks like. And I don't know what God's saying to you. But just know that in my dream, I kept seeing you run along and then people would get try to stray and you would come along and encourage and pull them back in and draw them back into the fold and I feel like that's something God wants to do with you and I don't know what you have to talk to your dad what that looks like but um, just know that there is something about that in you and um, 
there's something about your spirit that I just feel like what God is saying, that you're somebody that can compel and draw them back in even when they feel like quitting. So uh, take that and, and see what God's saying to you about it. Amen. God bless. Wasn't that good? Yeah. Invitation and challenge. Oh, oh. oh yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry about. <laughs> yeah. So invitation and challenge. So let me challenge you that if you're leading a C4 group and not eating, I challenge you yes. to share the soul. Yes. Amen. Break bread together. Stop being lazy. All right? And that's what it is. I'll call it as it is. All right? It's laziness. All right? It's too, oh, it's too much effort. If you're not eating together as a C4 group, get eating together. Okay? And uh, stop challenging. Even if you're doing that, if you're not eating together and taking that challenge, then you're probably not challenging each other anyway. So ask why you even exist. All right? And uh, let's shake it up. All right? We'll take that word. We'll take that word. I did tell Pastor Winnell and Paul last night that uh, I'd spent lots of times. It was a favorite subject last year, wasn't it? Eating together, eating together, eating together. Some of you are just in rebellion. You're just in rebellion. Okay? So that's that. And, uh, and, then, and then also, also... Um, you know, the, the invitation and challenge, we looked at all that last year and we spent, I think we spent about three months on that, opening up the scriptures and looking at the style of and methodology of Jesus' discipleship process. And uh, wakey, wakey, because that wasn't primed. That was God, the Holy Spirit, waking us up again, because I'm, I'm at the end of my tether with it, you know, because I love food. And some of you don't get it. So you need, a, you need a, a fat revolution in your life, in Jesus' name. Never trust a skinny chef. Okay? Never. I never trust a skinny chef. I, I didn't check on the chef last night. Okay. Now, all joking aside and all fun, and, and seriousness aside, okay, we, we thank you for coming and being with us. And uh, come on, give him a big clap. Yeah. We, we appreciate you, and it's been great to get to know you a bit. And I'm sure Dave's already plotting. Okay, he's already plotting. He's already in my ear. I mean, we were only walking back to the car last night, and he was in my ear about the next thing. What's next? And, uh, and that's really exciting. And some of the stuff you shared last night, we see how that can help us and support us and how we can sort of partner with you and actually uh, join with you in some of that stuff. So that'll be great. Okay? So... Can I close the service by saying, if you want prayer ministry this morning, I will grab some people to pray for you. Uh, please come and just stand here and make it known that you want to receive prayer this morning. And, uh, and we will pray with you and whatever, prophesy, healing, deliverance, whatever God wants to do in your life. Whatever your need is at the moment, come and receive from the Lord. Okay? And uh, God bless you. Have a, a great day. Uh, week. Uh, just a reminder, it's baptism preparation at my house uh, on Saturday at two o'clock. Okay. So, um, sorry. Yeah, we're bringing and sharing food on Sunday. So please, something, something savory, something sweet. Let's pack. I mean, the other, the other week we had a, a bring and share, didn't we? And the table was just heaving with food. Hallelujah! And so that's what we want. Amen? And we're gonna, what we're going to do, I think we did it once before, is we're going to set up a long table down the middle, put chairs around, and we're going we're gonna to feast. We're going to feast together in celebration. As long as we don't drown anyone, we can't celebrate that. So I'll make sure I hold on to them tightly. Yeah? I'm just looking at you when I say that. Okay? <laughs> All right. So, Father, go with us. Lord, use us. Lord, let us continue to, Lord, cause that word this morning to stew within our spirits. 
Lord, that it causes, for, uh, causes fruit to be bore out of it, Lord, that we would come alongside people and begin that discipleship journey to bring them to faith and to disciple them through the storms and difficulties and the good times and the breakthroughs for years to come, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friend.